Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining this side event um, on, on loss and damage and the importance of finance and the importance of delivering support to countries facing the um, impacts of the climate emergency. Um, I'm Colin McQuiston and I'm the Head of Climate and Resilience at Practical Action and I'm really pleased to be hosting this side event along with Oxfam International and Prakriti Resources Centre. Um, we've got two segments to the session today. Uh, the first segment is uh, a distinguished high-level panel with one of our speakers in the building on their way to this room right now. Um, and Gabriella Butcher, the Executive Director of Oxfam International, will lead the first, first session. Um, Oxfam International is a global network which fights inequality and climate change to end poverty and injustice. Ms. Butcher is an exper experienced social justice leader and deeply committed to tackling economic and gender inequality. Ms. Butcher, who grew up in Cali, Colombia, is a champion for feminist leadership and believes in the power of collaboration. She worked alongside children and communities affected by Colombia's decade long armed conflict and contributed to peace building and youth active citizenship, influencing the country's approach on restorative justice for children. Prior to Oxfam, Ms. Butcher was the Chief Operating Officer at Plan International and led Fundacion Plan Colombia. Gabrielle, I hand it to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Colin. And Thank you everyone for joining us today. And Minister, I'm very happy to have you here, welcome. And I'm really honored to be presenting today on, on behalf of Oxfam, but also the Prakiti Resources Center and Practical Action. And today we're focusing on justice. And this is the word that comes to define the struggle against climate breakdown today. And when I think of climate justice, I think of people like Claire and Therea. She lives in Kiribati, which is a large ocean state in the Central Pacific Ocean. For her, the very ground under her feet is at stake. Almost the entire land and area of Kiribati lies less than three meters above sea level. She told my colleagues in the Pacific, I'm scared, and I'm scared for my people. Over the last decade, weather-related disasters fueled by climate change have forced an estimated 20 million people a year to leave their homes. That's one person every two seconds. 80% of them are women. The words of my colleague, Ilapesi Masivis from Fiji, also have stayed with me. Fiji is also intensely vulnerable to sea level rise. The crisis, she says, is right there on our doorstep. It's a matter of our survival. It's about our identity, our generation, our sovereignty. Where does is this all end if we are not going to take action? These stories of irreversible climate damage are repeated again and again, with the impact of the climate crisis continuing to spiral. People in Madagascar are experiencing their worst drought in 40 years. For the past four years, rain has failed. Crops have withered. Many are facing severe hunger right now. Destructive floods, supercharged storms, and severe droughts are leading to losses of lives, jobs, and culture. I said justice defines our struggle today. Justice means recognizing that what is happening to people facing the worst impacts of the climate crisis, this isn't some act from the heavens or something that just has fallen on them somehow happened. No, the climate crisis is inflicted upon them and this requires redress. After all, this is a crisis created by the world's haves, which is devastating the lives of the world's have-nots. It's a crisis in which the carbon emissions of the 1% are 30 times the 1.5 degrees limit, as our new data shows. And it's a crisis in which the rich world, rich countries, are responsible for 92% of all excess emissions. And 
so also for 92% of all climate damages. Loss and damage is about justice. It's about recognizing the poorest countries are footing the bill for a crisis they did not cause. It's about rich countries being responsible and providing compensation they owe. The issue of loss and damage needs to be addressed at COP26 with rich countries committing to new finance to address this issue. For too long, rich countries have blocked progress on loss and damage. For over 30 years have Pacific Islanders called for loss and damage. And this must change. This event will talk about how we can make progress. Now every great change needs responsibility and bravery. And I'll be welcoming two speakers today who are providing both. So as um, Colin mentioned, um, our first minister is joining us uh, soon, the first minister of Scotland. But we have here um, the Honorable Mr. Ramsahai Prasad, who is the Minister of Forest and Environment of the Government of Nepal, a country who knows as much as any other developing nation why real financing for loss and damage must be a legacy for this Glasgow COP26. So First Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the organizer for hosting such an important event. The rising concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has led to a rise in average global temperature, causing local weather, syst local weather system to be more erratic than in the past and more devastating in terms of impacts. The extreme changes in weather and climate system are increasing loss and damage in developing and least developed countries like Nepal. Nepal is among the most vulnerable countries to climate change. The impact of climate change has been observed in various sectors like water, forestry, biodiversity, agriculture, and the cryosphere. In Nepal, climate-induced disasters cause around 60% of all disaster-related annual deaths. This year, we had enormous losses due to climate-induced disasters such as floods, landslides, fire. The average annual economic loss from climate-induced disasters is about 2% of the GDP. Multiple studies have predicted an increase in loss and damage caused by climate-induced disaster will trigger the loss of up to 13% of Nepal GDP at the end of this century. Distinguished participants, we welcome the progress made in operationalizing the Santiago network on loss and damage. But it is not enough unless there, there is no, there is an agreement on other issues critical to loss and damage, including the government governance of Warsaw mechanism on loss and damage, which we understand it is under the dual governance of COP and CMP. Let me take this opportunity to sincerely thank Scotland for its pledge to mobilize finance for loss and damage. We hope other countries will replicate this initiative. Let me take this opportunity to sincerely thank loss and damage finance has not accelerated as we wished in COP26. We want a robust outcome on the provision of financial support to vulnerable countries like Nepal. Nepal wants to see Glasgow facility on loss and damage established in COP26. Finance is key to responding effectively to climate-induced disasters. It is therefore important to establish a loss and damage finance facility with new and additional loss and damage finance.
distinguished ladies and gentlemen on the contrary nepal has been proactively engaged in creating an a condu conducive policy environment to address the impact of loss and damage the cabinet has endorsed the national framework on loss and damage this framework contextualized loss and damage in our national and mountain specific context nepal has already taken inno innovative approaches to avoid the impact and the risk of climate induced disasters this includes risk assessment risk reduction risk transfer and risk retention such approaches aim to building long term resilience of countries vulnerable populations and communities to loss and damage distinguished ladies and gentlemen adverting minimizing and reducing the impact of loss and damage needs a global commitment and coalition among countries finance technology transfer and capacity building are key to the ensuring that vulnerable countries like nepal to be better equipped to respond to climate change impacts thank you so much Thank you very much, um, Minister Ramsahai Prasad, um, for your words. Thank At this you. point, we'd like to welcome the First Minister of Scotland, um, Nicola Sturgeon, to give her address. Uh, she's just joined us. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you uh, very much for uh, your uh, very inspiring comments. Uh, I want to begin today by thanking Oxfam International for organising this event. Uh, I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking to you, but this is possibly one of the most important events happening at this COP because of the importance of the issue that is under discussion. Uh, we all know how important these discussions in Glasgow last week and this week are. Uh, the discussions here in Glasgow, of course, were never going to address and tackle climate change in its entirety. But there is no doubt that these discussions and the outcome that comes from them tomorrow, I hope, or perhaps into the weekend, will be critical in determining, to put it bluntly, whether this planet of ours that we bequeath to future generations continues to be a sustainable and indeed a habitable one. So the onus of responsibility on the shoulders of every single government represented here could not be greater. There is a real responsibility over the remaining hours of this summit to ensure that commitments are made to a reduction in emissions in this decade, not at some distant point in the future, but in this decade that are sufficient to keep that essential goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees alive. Uh, that really is what we must see from leaders and governments represented here. And if that is to be achieved, then there is no doubt that commitments on climate finance must also step up and be delivered. 12 years ago in Copenhagen, as many of you know, because many of you may well have been there, developed countries made a promise. They made a promise of $100 billion of climate finance every year from 2020. Uh, in Paris, that promise was repeated. But the hard reality is that today, 12 years on, and already one year after the date when that promise was meant to be delivered, that $100 billion is still not committed to and is not being delivered. Uh, that, in my view, is simply unacceptable and inexcusable and it will be even more unacceptable and inexcusable if that remains the reality when this summit here in Glasgow closes over the next couple of days and it is unacceptable because if developed countries cannot meet a commitment made 12 years ago to provide funding that is not only right but necessary and essential then how do we expect developing countries 
vulnerable countries, island communities that are right now experiencing the impact of climate change to believe or trust any of the other pledges and commitments that are made at summits like this. So I don't think we can overstate the importance of seeing that commitment delivered. Uh, now, of course, it is quite difficult uh, to uh, get a true sense of what has been pledged uh, and what has uh, still to be pledged around that commitment. But uh, many assessments would suggest that the shortfall in that is not huge. But whatever it is, it must be made up because it has become, understandably and rightly so, a fundamental issue of trust. But it's also important because that commitment is essential to unlocking progress in other areas. Uh, the issue of climate funding cannot be separated from the issue of keeping 1.5 degrees alive. The two are inextricably linked and must be seen as that. I think for those looking into this summit from the outside, I'm sure there's a lot of frustration. There is something I must admit I share to some extent this sense of frustration. Frustration. Uh, there is something not quite right about the uh, idea of countries coming together to negotiate and haggle and seek compromises over something as fundamental as the future of the planet. But we know uh, that there, are, uh, there is a necessity of political processes to turn commitments into reality. Some of that is complex. I uh, understand that as the leader of a government. But that funding commitment should be one of the easier commitments to meet. So let's hope that in these next few hours uh, we see that happen. Uh, there's no doubt this is one of the most important gatherings of this century and therefore if we cannot as an outcome of this see the developed world commit a tiny proportion of the world's GDP to meet a promise made 12 years ago uh, then there is something far wrong. So at this 11th hour uh, let's make that uh, demand clear again to the leaders around the negotiating table. Step up now and deliver that commitment because it is so important for its own sake, but to delivering everything else that we need to see delivered. The issue on finance, though, that I want to address here because it is, of course, the subject of uh, the uh, gathering we're having here this evening is loss and damage. Uh, the Scottish Government coming into this COP summit, recognising that while we are playing host here in Glasgow, we're not a government around the negotiating table, uh, thought carefully about the issues we wanted to try to put on the agenda and to use whatever influence we had to drive progress on. And coming out of the discussions that we helped facilitate in the Glasgow Climate Dialogues, it was clear to us that the issue of loss and damage is one that we should seek to put on the agenda and try to drive progress on. Uh, it is, of course, the case that mitigation and adaptation, the issues talked about uh, most often when we consider climate finance, are important. They are vitally important. Mitigation is hugely important. We must take the action to reduce climate change, to tackle climate change, and we must invest in adaptation to help countries across the world adapt to deal with the impacts that we know are coming. So these things are important and we should not lose focus on them, but they are not enough in themselves. Because the reality is, I've just come from a session in the plenary hall uh, where I shared a panel with Vanessa Nakati, who like so many other climate activists, have spelt out in heartbreaking detail the impact that many countries across our shared planet are suffering right now. These are uh, impacts that are being suffered right now that can't simply be adapted to because they are happening now. Countries, populations, human beings are suffering loss and damage and we must recognise that and we must take the action to address it. An event I was at yesterday, it was attended by a climate activist from Peru where she uh, put it much, much more eloquently, obviously, than I ever could. And she said this, what has been lost will never come back. My nieces don't know the Amazon like I did. So that's not something that can be adapted to or mitigated against. That is loss, that is damage, that is pain, that is suffering that is being experienced right now. And developed countries, 
the rich, developed, industrialised countries that have caused climate change, that have built their prosperity, their economies, their well-being on the climate emissions that we have pumped into the atmosphere have a responsibility to step up, recognise that and address it. And to do so not as some act of charity, but as a fundamental basic act of reparation to the countries that have not caused climate change, but are today living with the most immediate impact of it. So that, that is the issue that the Scottish Government decided we would do everything we could to put on the agenda at this COP. And let me uh, be blunt, loss and damage should never not be on the agenda of COPs from now on, but it must be more than simply on the agenda. From this COP, we must see real action uh, on this, and that's something, as we come out of these discussions in Glasgow, I pledge to you that the Scottish Government will continue uh, to press for and show leadership on. But it wasn't enough for us to come into this COP pledging to put something on the agenda. As with anything else, if you want others to listen to your rhetoric, you must be prepared to lead by example. That's what Scotland did back in 2012 when we became the first country in the world to establish a climate justice fund. Back then, we wanted to recognise and play our part in helping mitigate climate injustice. And we decided that we, if we were to be taken seriously on the issue of loss and damage, must do the same on that. So last week we confirmed we became the first country, developed country in the world, which is shameful that we, uh, almost at the end of this COP, are still the only developed country in the world to have done this. We committed uh, funding specifically to loss and damage. In a global context, a small amount of money, one million pounds, which we will allocate in partnership with the Climate Justice Resilience Fund to help communities rebuild and repair the damage and loss that they are suffering. Um, that is a commitment we have made uh, and today we have decided already to double that commitment as part, <laughs> as part of an 11th hour effort to show the leadership in the relatively small way we can that I hope will spark other countries over these final hours to step up to. Uh, if we are calling on others to up their contribution and close the funding gap, we have to be prepared to do so too. Uh, coming into the summit, we had pledged to double our climate justice fund that we set up in 2012. Today, the Scottish Government has announced that we will not double it, we will treble it to show that leadership that we're asking other countries to follow and as part of that double that commitment to loss and damage. So I think that we really should be blunt and be as straightforward in the language we use in these final hours of this summit as possible. It is not any longer excusable or acceptable for the richest countries in the world not to step up on climate finance. It is no longer excusable or acceptable to close our eyes to the loss and damage that is being done to countries around the world already. We have a moral obligation to step up and do the right thing. We have that moral obligation for its own sake, but we also must do it because that is the key to making the progress we need to make more widely. So I pledge you today that the Scottish Government will continue to do what we can to show leadership. I am determined as we come out of this COP to seek to build a coalition. I hope we see good progress in the final outcome of this COP, perhaps to a fund that we can all donate into for loss and damage, a clear commitment to making this a central priority next year at COP and every year for as long as necessary. But we will do what we can to build on the commitments in Glasgow this week to build that coalition, to build that support for recognising the debt, the obligation, the reparation that countries like ours owe to those who are suffering the worst impacts of climate change already. So let me end by thanking all of you, Oxfam in particular, for the leadership you have shown across civil society to spark 
this debate to move politicians like me and my government to do the right thing, to give us the power now uh, and the authority to go forward and to press others to do likewise together. And I uh, hope we will work together during the final hours of this summit, but thereafter to make sure that all of us face up to that moral obligation. Thank you very much for your support and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your eloquent words, but mostly I think for the hope and the energy you bring into the room that we really trust is contagious to all the other leaders um, who are here, who are there to, to make these agreements happen. Because as you say, it's not an act of, of charity, it's really an act of, of, of justice and redress. And as the minister was saying, mm -hmm. um, in a country like Nepal, this can have uh, enormous consequences. And you were speaking about significant amounts of your GDP being um, affected by, by loss and damage. But um, leading by example, by contributing as you have and by demonstrating that it can be done and we expect this to be part of the outcomes for, for this conference. So thank you very much. And at this moment, I would like to invite uh, Tasnim Esop, the Executive Director of the Climate Action Network, um, uh, who is going to briefly join us. And Tasnim, the network, has awarded Scotland one of their coveted Rays of the Day awards in recognition of this positive lead that you have done. So Tasnim. Thank you, Gabriella and ministers, First Minister of Scotland. <clears throat> uh, immensely inspired by what you shared with us today, uh, we, the, the Climate Action Network International that I head, and Oxfam is a member, made together with many civil society organizations and partners, made the issue of finance for loss and damage our big priority for this COP, and in fact, we made it the litmus test for the success of this COP. So it is really inspiring uh, to have seen the actions that you've taken as the government of Scotland. And on Monday, when <laughs> you made the announcement about uh, the contribution, the financial contribution of one million pounds, to the Climate Justice Fund for loss and damage. We, of course, believed that this was well deserved of the ray of the day that the Climate Action Network um, uh, awards to those who pr provide us with shining hope and inspiration. And so already when you made the announcement, we awarded you with the ray of the day and <clears throat> of course, you know, that you leading by example and we hope that others, rich nations would follow. And you've made our exercise slightly in, <laughs> uh, uh, inconvenient because now you've doubled your amount. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to just scratch out the one million and I'm going to turn that into two million. And I hope that we can do this with all the other commitments that rich nations have made but broken. So it would be amazing if we could take a pen and rich nations could say we've delivered our 100 billion commitment today. But Minister, you deserve this ray of the day for your leadership, for the government of Scotland's leadership, and we look to all others now to follow your lead. It is an amended ray of the day. It now reflects two million at the stroke of a pen. Thank you very much. With this ceremony, we end this part of the event. And hand over to Colin.
introduced us at the beginning. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, um, how do you beat that? That's going to be really difficult to follow. But um, I'm now going to invite the panel for the second part of the uh, session to come up. So if uh, Dr. Yiching Song could come and, and join the panel up here, uh, Mr. Sunil Acharya, uh, Nushrat Chowdhury, and Dr. Reinhard Meckler, if you could make your seats at the panel. Thank you. Very, very bright up here. I can hardly see people, <laughs> which is probably good. So uh, we're going to start with uh, a short video, but um, let me first of all introduce our first speaker, Dr. Yichin Song. Uh, she obtain, obtained her PhD in rural sociology and development from Wageningen University in the Netherlands in 1998. And since 2000, she's been a senior researcher and program leader in the Center for Chinese Agricultural Policy, uh, uh, which is a, a part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. She is also a lecturer professor of China Agricultural University and the Southwest China University. She has been an in invited as gender and social expert and advisor for IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and is leading the UN Women Supported Rural Women's Economic Empowerment Program for Poverty Allevi Alleviation in Qinghai Province. Uh, and that is what uh, Dr. Song is going to be talking about. So if we could have the, the video, please. Jingsha 而得名不怎么好但近年来金沙江干热河谷变得愈发干旱他们充分利用精巧的民沟暗渠系统这个是石队
，那个的盖一盖厂，最好的那一个会挂在地天柱上面，一个是留住，一个是地柱地天，呃，多出成分都包含在里面了。他再说，这不是我们有什么才能，就是我们的祖先有智慧。把这一块这个这个大石头给我们留下来，就是我们应该要保护它，一是保护，一个石头里面做做保护人家。二零一五年，在多家科研机构和科学家的帮助下，村民利用村里的公共空间，建立了社区种子银行。那么我们把这些，啊、呃，村里边的一些，啊、呃，老呢。另外的话，就是从这个外地交流下来的一些种子，通过不断的恢复以后，把这些相对好的种子就留在这点了。我们啊，真正的搬在这个地方的只是一点点，其实真正的种子，就是藏在老百姓的窖里边啊，藏在老百姓的窖里边。这里是我的珠子库，珠子全部都放在那了。这是桃花菜，葱。我水吧，这是这是四季豆，在我留留期多一点是，人家要的时候给他们做。他们收起老种子，如数家珍；做起农家饭，样样在行。去到村外，他们载歌载舞，自信满满的展示山地原住民的文化。二零二一年十月十二日，社区。科学与社会组织在生物多样性保护利用中的角色与合作高端政策论坛和对话，在云南昆明成功召开。来自七个省、十六个农村社区的七十位农民代表参加会议，并与科学家进行交流和对话。这些年的时候，通过种子网络，我了解到，第一呢，他们不是要复古。他们也在创新，他们是在也在育种，就是说，说老品种这个名字啊，就是是一个大家比较容易理解，其实不是这么回事。老品种一直在创新，他们是通过这种差异式的由农户然后为主体的育种啊这个活动，所以我觉得它是一个非常有意义，所以这个是体现在创新里面。第二个的话就是说，农民育种的这个过程啊，是一个建立起这个社区自信。的过程，哎，他们发现他们自己也能做，就是过去我们科学家才会做的事，所以他建立出自信。You can speak from here. Yeah. Okay. Do I need microphone? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. It's all magic. <laughs> good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and good evening and morning in other worlds globally in attending this uh, uh, side event uh, online. I'm very, very honored to be in this session and highly appreciated uh, uh, Oxfam International invite me to talk here on behalf of my communities back in China and my smallholder farmers, rural women. China is not a vulnerable country, as you know, but we do have vulnerable communities, vulnerable populations. Those communities are in the uh, mountain ecosystems, dry land ecosystems, and even in the coastland, coast areas. And because... Yes, I will talk about uh, So I, that's why I am so appreciative the uh, Oxfam Hong Kong support us. Oxfam Hong Kong is the major supporter for us for the community-based work since 2016 until now. So highly, highly appreciated to support us to continue the work to, to uh, uh, so you just saw the, uh, the movie, which is uh, very inspiring and very uh, hopeful, encouraging. And I do hope those uh, uh, hope of uh, moving and uh, can continue. So very uh, uh, thank, thanks, uh, Oxfam Hong Kong first. Okay, I will start uh, to, to do some explaining about uh, the photos because I cannot uh, explain, go to all the vulnerable communities. Today I'm focused uh, on the uh, community. I just showed the video with you. Uh, okay, 
next one. Okay. So I just move here. Okay. So we do have the vulnerable communities, and then we do experience the do uh, loss and the damage. Uh, here, I will talk more about the uh, southwest part of China because China is so big and uh, uh, focus on more drought. Uh, uh, drought. In the last uh, 10 years, southwest part of China is really experienced very big drought, spring drought and the summer big flood. Uh, flood. So those here, you can see the big damages uh, all in, uh, in southwest part of China in the, uh, uh, like 10 years ago. And, and after that, continually, every year, you know, this is the location of the uh, four villages. You just saw the video. Uh, the community are located here uh, in the upstream of Yangtze River uh, near Tibet, not so far from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Nepal. And the landscape are quite similar, mountain ones. But it's very much a uh, culture and biodiversity rich areas. It's a uh, UNESCO's uh, culture heritage and the natural heritage places there. It's beautiful, but they are really facing a very, very uh, climate change impact in terms of drought in the spring and the big flood in summer. However, they try very hard. The first factor they focus on is water. So all the four communities, they manage to working on the, the ancient irrigation systems, trying to manage those systems through customer laws, through uh, collective actions, and manage to, to, to maintaining and to uh, those water systems uh, to ensure that the, their farming and their livelihood can continue. A second factor they, uh, they, they're working on is seed. They think that seed is very, very important. What they said is that seed in hand, secure in, in life. This is really uh, showing that in the last spring, when China was knocked down by the COVID-19, the whole spring was shut down and then a lot of communities cannot sow in because they rely on the market for seed. But we have uh, uh, done some uh, research for some community we're working with. We're working with more than 40 communities uh, in all over China in different uh, vulnerable uh, areas. And then we collected four, uh, 14 communities. They managed to, to sow in and then to, to continue their livelihood farming and the life, because they have their own seed. Not only those 14 communities, all the communities, they maintain their own seed, they can secure their life in the crisis. Okay, not only in the southwest part of China, I said that in the, also in the other wells, the community seed bank are also working. So this is really a common space for communities and for, for maintain their common goods. She are to do in common actions. So this is what the, the policy part. We have done two pre-COP uh, activities to discussion with uh, scientists, communities, and uh, uh, local uh, civil societies, NGOs. And the conclusion is that community don't have enough support, not enough recognition. They need further support and further recognition immediately and urgently. So it's fortunately that we, uh, we, uh, uh, we hosted the only one side event in COP15 in Kunming last October. This is also supported by Oxfam, Oxfam Hong Kong together with uh, uh, other uh, uh, NGOs. And then we managed to invite the uh, uh, executive secretary uh, of CBD to give a talk in our side event to give support to our com uh, communities. That's make our community become more confident. I do hope this confidence can continue and then the hope is moving. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Song. Um, our, our second presenter is uh, Nushrat Chowdhury. Uh, Nushrat is the loss and damage specialist at Christian Aid Bangladesh. 
She is a development pro professional with more than nine years' experience in the humanitarian sector in Bangladesh, and she's looking to further develop her career in sustainable development. Nushrat's first-hand knowledge and experience is in uh, community development, policy advocacy, communications, and recently in the field of loss and damage. Um, her focus is, as a development professional <coughs> is to contribute to giving voice to those less privileged amongst us. So Nushrat, if you'd like to give your presentation. Thank you, Colin. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. And today I would like to show you the face of climate change loss and damage in the global south, particularly in my country. It's a really challenging task, but I will attempt to. We are going through a very critical time, both developed and developing countries. Extreme weather events are on increase. We saw the severe floods in Germany, Belgium, China, scorching heat in USA and uh, in Canada, and also in the global south last year, Cyclone Eta and Aota hit Central America in the month of November within just two weeks of gaps. And then Cyclone Amphan hitting India and my country, Bangladesh. And currently, Madagascar, which is going through a severe drought in last 40 years. Uh, these are some photos from floods in Germany and China. Uh, people lost their lives, museum, galleries, churches were washed away. We know that climate change loss and damage has two type, two aspects. One is uh, economic losses and one is non-economic losses. So these are some examples of, of non-economic losses. It's really difficult to put price over loss of life, loss of biodiversity, ecosystem services, indigenous uh, knowledges, and this is the scenario in both uh, developing and developed countries. And it is projected that in developing countries, these non-economic losses will be much higher in coming days. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, the developed countries well responded to the crisis. So, I mean, very shortly, all the developed countries responded with millions of pounds of dollars. Uh, to respond to this crisis, emergency fund, and later on with rehabilitation work, I mean, after disaster interventions. But it, when it comes to developing countries, the situation is different, it's opposite, and uh, some of the reasons are uh, climate vulnerability, geographical locations, limited, and, uh, limited financial and technical capacity. Just an example, I'm putting here the example of uh, Madagascar. 1.4 million people are food insecure because of climate-induced uh, disaster. And just to tell you, this is the uh, first ever climate change uh, disaster declared, this crisis. And children are malnourished uh, mal uh, and people are living on cactus, locust, and wild leaves. Basically, they are trying to have whatever in their surrounding. Cyclone Eta and Aota hit Central America in last November, and they were able to sort of, this, this two cyclones in one month affected 6.8 million people in just one month. So lives and livelihoods were severely affected, and some of the, uh, uh, I mean, the statistics is here, and some of the quotations you can see, and these are some pictures, what happens when a cyclone hits. I'm narrowing down my focus to my country, Bangladesh, uh, which is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. And it's not like that we are not doing to respond to this crisis. So my country, Bangladesh, has been investing in disaster risk reduction actions since 19, late 1960s. Currently, it is spending six to seven per percent of its GDP to adapt to climate change. Despite this crisis, we are going to lose 17% of our land to climate change. Floods, cyclones, both are intense, both are frequent. In every three to five years, two thirds of our land are flooded. And in from 2017 to 2021, we have had 10 cyclones. Just imagine a small country, a small community going to cyclone sort of almost every year and we have two cyclone seasons. Uh, I took this photo right after Cyclone Mora. I would like to 
mention this specific point because but the big disasters get attention, but the, not the small localized disasters. So Cyclone Mora were able to kill seven people, but the consequent disaster, the secondary disaster, killed 144 people. So all the localized disasters which are not in the media, they are sometimes, you know, cause havoc in much larger scale. Uh, this was, uh, what happened, what is happening is that we have intense flood, but the problem is that we are great adapters, by the way, Bangladeshi people, but the problem is that it's difficult to predict the weather. So we are not, uh, the, the community people are not able to or understand the water level, how much it will rise, and we do have weak early warning system. That's why this family were not able to evacuate, evac evacuate properly and resulted in this temporary uh, shelter. Thank you. As the Honorable Minister was saying that we need uh, global action, we echo with him. We say that loss and damage needs to be addressed as First Minister was saying very eloquently, uh, we, we want loss and damage to be accepted as a core climate justice issue. We need to mobilize fund, we need to have additional fund, and we need to, re we need to have the tractions which mitigation and adaptation have. And also we know that humanitarian, fund, humanitarian area is very under-resourced, so we need adequate fund for disaster recovery so that people are on track and are able to build, rebuild their life. And when it comes to social, social protection, Bangladesh currently has 100 social protection schemes. It's not enough. So we need more, more funding for social protection, and we need to ensure social protection for climate vulnerable people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nushrat. Um, we're going to have plenty of time at the end for questions, so please do jot your questions down and uh, we will have a, a, a Q&A session right at the very end. But it's now a pleasure to hand over to Sunil Acharya. Uh, Sunil is the Regional Advisor for Climate and Resilience at Practical Action with a specialist focused on South Asia and the least developed countries. Sunil is based in the Practical Action Nepal office and he leads efforts in integrating climate and disaster resilience into our programs. And he's also active in I external influencing on the climate agenda in the country and in the region. As a long-time participant in the UN climate negotiations, Sunil is attending COP26 to influence positive outcomes on the issue of loss and damage, specifically focused on robust technical and financial support systems for communities and people suffering from irreversible climate impacts. Sunil, over to you. Thank you very much, Colin, for that uh, introduction. It's my pleasure to be here in this session today. I'm going to talk about our recent study that Practical Action, together with Prakriti Resources Center, conducted in Nepal, looking into the current approaches to dealing with some of the climate impacts. So as my minister earlier stressed that the reality, we are living with the reality of loss and damage already in Nepal. Uh, the country is hot spot of several spectrum of climate impacts, both in terms of extreme weather events like floods, landslides, drought, and extreme temperatures. But also we are experiencing slow onset events that include glacial retreat, land, and biodiversity loss. But with escalating climate impacts, what has happened is, is we now cannot predict what kind of uh, climate hazards will happen in which locality. The recent post-monsoon floods in some of the uh, rain shadow regions of the country in up mountain, which never used to have flooding or not, not even precip uh, rainfall, they, they used to only have snow, but now they have started to experience rainfall and consequences that they have started to face flooding, which was only experienced in the plains uh, region. So the point is, it is more difficult to determine which areas should prepare for what kind of climate disaster. So uh, just to look into who is paying for this increasing losses and damages that we are experiencing. I will cite the example from the 2015, that was the 2017 floods in Nepal. So the floods were widespread across the 35 district of 75 uh, district in Nepal. 
with several districts experiencing rainfall at the scale that was not known over 60 years. 1.7 million people were affected, and the total loss and damage included 800 and 584 million. The recovery costs were more than that. But if you look into the figures on what support Nepal received from the humanitarian sources, it was tiny. This 20, around 21.9 million support was received from the humanitarian sources, and the Nepal government was forced to mobilize its own resources that would have otherwise gone to other development activities in line of 20 to 30 million. But what happened was it was the poor household, the poor communities who were forced to pay for the losses and damages which they were not causing. So basically, if you see that the international support available for uh, addressing loss and damage is nowhere near to what is needed, and the developed countries keep on telling that the existing approaches that we have are sufficient to address those, which is not. We also looked into some of the existing approaches from the climate change adaptation community of practice and also the, uh, from the disaster risk reduction community of practice, and we see that the existing approaches which are used to assess and address climate-induced loss and damages are not enough. We see that there are several gaps. In terms of economic, quantifying economic losses, they are not able to do that. But also, uh, there, are, there are severe gaps in terms of assessing the non-economic losses. They cannot assess the slow onset events that are crippling over the years. There is no way they can distinguish the acceptable, tolerable, or intolerable risk. And then these impacts, which could have been avoided, cannot be avoided. So, uh, but having said that, there is a scope to build upon the existing approaches, but countries such as Nepal and other vulnerable uh, developing nations require support, the technical assistance that they need to identify the, the loss and damage needs and to implement measures to address those gaps, which is not available at the moment. But the countries like Nepal are putting in place the policies and programmatic actions already. For example, if you see in the case of Nepal, the country has said that the, the national climate change policy says that it will prioritize loss and damage. The second national uh, determined contribution that they submitted recently also said that they would have developed a strategy and action plan to address loss and damage, but for that they require technical assistance and they require financial support. The country also uh, implements a number of programmatic actions, including in the areas of risk reduction, which uh, have examples like the structural measures to um, build flood, flood protection measures, or the non-structural measures, which include uh, the traditional indigenous practice of, for example, the case of biodike uh, that uses the, the, uh, the over-the-year practiced community-centered approach of using nature to protect floods. Similarly, they, they have been implementing some uh, risk retention measures, such as the social pr protection schemes, but also some of the risk transfer measures, such as uh, parametric insurances. They are in pilot phase, but they are nowhere near to address loss and damage. So, uh, as I stress, there is the challenge for effective action on loss and damage, because the countries like Nepal are not being able to get the technical support that is required, but also the challenges with the political and institutional um, structures that uh, are to be put in place. Those includes a number of uh, areas, including how the current practice or the best practice on disaster risk reduction can be enhanced, how the, uh, the institutional mechanism can be tailored to the coming challenge or the, uh, the ongoing challenge of loss and damage, but to do all that, there is an urgent need for dedicated finance for loss and damage, which is nowhere to be seen at the moment, except from the, the announcement that we saw from the Scottish government. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Sunil. Um, so we've heard three country studies, but now we're gonna hear from the science policy framing of loss and damage. I think one of the challenges that we face is being clear on how and why loss and damage is different from humanitarian assistance, from disastrous reduction, from climate change adaptation. So we've invited Reinhard to share his thoughts. 
Reinhard is the lead of the Systemic Risk and Resilience Group at the International Institute for Applied Systems and Analysis. What a mouthful. <laughs> as well as the senior lecturer in the University of Economics and Business in Vienna. His research focus include climate and catastrophic risk assessment, risk management, policy and governance, as well as resilience-based development strategies. He is a lead author in the IPCC Special Report on Adaptation to Extreme Events, the fifth assessment report, uh, and he's also a member of the working group for comprehensive risk management under the Warsaw International Mechanism. So, Reinhard, over to you. Yeah, <coughs> thanks Colin for the introduction and yeah, long introduction. Pleasure to be in that session. We heard about, we heard a pledge being made in the beginning. Now we heard from colleagues, it's obviously not enough, right? Not enough finance there. And I wanted to try to put um, yeah, the question where to find finance, where to find additional finance. I wanted to put that um, forward and take, take on a risk science perspective, how to think about this as a contribution to the debate and the questions later on. Um, the science is pretty clear, right? You've seen the RPCC report in 21, in April, I think. Um, colleagues from the physical science um, um, group pretty much laid out that, yeah, climate is changing, but also hazard intensity, frequency, and durations are changing. Here you see it for heat waves. We see it as a collective problem, right? Heat is changing globally in Northern Europe, but also in Asia. And um, this is the red parts to it. And we see also the dots here. They show that it's actually, it's human. It's all of us emitting emissions, leading con concentrations, and really, the attribution has been made, certainly for heat waves, that it's us, all of us behind it. I'm also to blame, of course. So that's pretty clear. Um, that's about hazards. Um, expect more about risk and adaptation later in February from working group two. Um, but from IPCC, this will take a bit longer. But um, what's important to say, um, we got a, glo a global problem, but we got a pro problem that plays out heavily in places that are more limit prone and vulnerable. And what we are seeing, we're seeing adaptation limits, limits to adaptive capacity and limits to adaptation. First evidence was put out in the special report on the 1.5 degree centigrade IPCC report. And we see indeed uh, limits um, yeah, to coping with human health in tropical megacities, in coastal livelihoods. I've heard that from colleagues, uh, coastal livelihoods are being challenged. You see that in the middle also, Bangladesh. Um, land is literally yeah, eroded, being eroded. And then also small islands, of course, um, are being affected and here it's becoming tough today already and in the future to adapt to that. Also impacts in humans in, in natural systems. We see coral reefs also being degraded at 1.5 and 2 degrees. So clearly there's an issue here. It's not only hazard changing, it's risk proliferating and it's also those adaptation limits becoming yeah, severe and existential limits, existential impacts being reached. Um, yeah, the question is then, obviously the impetus is clear, it's, it's more as it needs to be done and how to think about this um, busy chart coming, attention, sorry for that. So risks are certainly playing out, we have risks and we have those residual risks that also Sunil referred to. Sounds small and tiny, but of course we know the residual risks are massive everywhere, particularly in those places that are more limit prone and facing existential risk. So what needs to be done? We need risk reduction, prevention, preparedness. We need risk finance. That can be insurance, but that can also be social protection. It can be many things. It's not only about insurance, clearly. It's about many other things. But we're seeing also those limits popping up. And then we see that chunk here, risk retention, as we frame it more technically. But that's certainly where you go beyond the limits, where people are being forced out, migration happens, and livelihoods are being lost. Increasingly, we need transformational adaptation. That's also a key word, a buzzword, but that's being filled with life by practitioners, colleagues sitting here, but also by science. Why I'm showing that, um, the idea is this is about risk, this is about today's impacts, but it's about future impacts. How can loss and damage cooperate with DRR, so disaster risk reduction and climate adaptation? Suggestion being that, um, yeah, it's a lot about um, finding additional finance for doing, yeah, taking action on incremental and transformational action. And that's certainly also complemented by DRR and climate adaptation funding. But then there's this high layer here, we call it curative finance. You can also replace curative by compensation and so on. So there's something, how to think about this in the framework um, that could probably, could maybe be interesting to, to think about in order to, to make that case that there's a space for loss and damage because we heard it from the First Minister of Scotland. Loss and damage is not a standing agenda item, but I would argue, and 
also a fellow scientist would argue there's a certain, there's certainly a, a, a space for that and certainly that should also be deliberated at COPS and elsewhere. So that's more technical. Let's also go into quickly on the principles, into the ethical and the risk principles, and they're actually overlapping. Um, in the bottom you see uh, three types of principles you could think about. One is mutuality. You build a risk pool, you can do insurance, but you can also retain the, the risk yourself. And um, so that's within a pool where everybody is affected. That's great, that's important, but we need solidarity. We heard that also from the first minister, minister and we heard that also from colleagues. Solidarity are those people outside of that pool not, that are not directly at risk and may not be directly affected, but we all live up to that. We're all providing solidarity on a daily basis and it's happening here a little bit. Now comes up the third, third chunk, which is taking it forward. Accountability also needs to be taken forward. That's more the perceived ethical or legal obligations. If you can attribute impacts, risks to climate change and that's people are working on. So that doesn't need to mean uh, like litigation in courts, but certainly implies being responsible and answerable. I thought you heard that from colleagues today also. Um, that's basically what I, yeah. What I wanted to say, it's happening. Uh, if you play that out, this logic, we, we have what's happening on loss and damage. We got national funds and mechanisms in Bangladesh. We got a loss and damage fund. That's more national solidarity because it's not being funded by the global north. Maybe the Scottish money could help with that. We got risk finance, where we got risk pools in the Caribbean and Africa and Pacific Islands are also part of it. Here we have mutuality and international solidarity because it's being funded by donors as well. And then we got this African pool where we also got accountability in there. There's this African risk capacity pool that has this extreme climate facility that should be capitalized if you can attribute changes in risk to human-induced climate change. It's not being implemented completely, but it's being thought about. So here accountability comes in. My last point is you could certainly argue that the Climate Justice Fund that will, um, pro well, that um, the First Minister of Scotland pledged funding for too, that this is based on solidarity and accountability. And I think we need to think about accountability. So thanks for the attention. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Reinhard. So now it's over to you. Um, if you have a question, then please come to one of the microphones and, uh, and ask it. And uh, maybe while you're thinking, um, I will ask the panelists for their thoughts on, we have this log gem in the negotiations at the moment. We know we need more finance, but the developed countries, the donors, the private sector is unwilling to finance uh, loss and damage. So I'd like to ask the panelists to maybe come up with a suggestion of how do they think we can overcome this, this, this log jam? What do you think the, the best thing we can do in the last day and a half to shift the negotiations forward? Anybody like to go first? Okay, Sunil, thank you. Yeah, uh, that is a very important question, Colin, uh, uh, the way the negotiations stand at this moment, at the, 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 the approach, we are approaching the end of COP26. So uh, the thing we know is that we are not going to solve all the problems of climate change here in Glasgow by COP26. But at least what we want to see is that the developed countries have been recognizing that they need to enhance the action which is critically low at the moment. They have been saying that as a rhetoric in their statements, but what we want to see here in action in the decision text is the fact that they put that uh, rhetoric into some sort of a process in which they recognize that a mechanism to initiate a process which starts to deliver loss and damage finance is in, uh, put in place here so that we can go on to the next years to come up with the modalities of how that can be operationalized. But we want to see from this COP here at COP26 that a facility or a mechanism on loss and damage is established. Thank you. Would anybody else from the panel like to <coughs> make some suggestions? I would like to say um, we welcome the progress on Santiago network on loss and damage, which is positive. But at the same time, if you want to talk about moral obligation, because leaders are pledging 
they are coming up with a lot of pledges, but we need more action because this is unfair, that this is immoral. And we need to talk about climate change, loss and damage, because it talks about climate justice. So we need to so see the justice, we need to see the actions, we need to see these pledges translating into action. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the, the audience. Go ahead. And please introduce yourself here. Yes, thank you. My name is Jan Thomas Odegaard. I'm director of the Development Fund of Norway. And we work with um, adaptation with local communities in a number of countries. Now, we have been pushing the Norwegian government for many years to uh, contribute to loss and damage. Every time we try that, they say, we don't really know the difference between adaptation and loss and damage. Loss and damage is not humanitarian aid. What is, where is the distinction? And I think this may be an excuse for not entering into it because they are extremely worried about amounts of money that it may require. But I think it's necessary to have a debate where we draw the line. We can't define it, it's hard to support it. So I want to hear your comments on that. For instance, the case from China, that looks very much like we do with the local communities in many countries, but we just call it adaptation. But there is this gray zone. How can we deal with that and convince our governments this is a different category and not necessarily humanitarian aid? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And uh, maybe we'll just go down the panel. So, Reinhard, would you yeah. like to start? Yeah, excellent. Good question. Yeah, that's, I, I think um, indeed there's a blurry line, there's a gray line, right? Just as there's a line between disaster risk and climate adaptation. But just as Sunil and I were indicating, it's certainly about those residual risks, right? It's those impacts, those risks that you cannot fully avoid and those impacts have become real and manifest as you've seen it. So, so I think if you apply this risk logic that I was suggesting, it's rather clear that there's a big chunk here that is not being attended to. And that's true for Norway, that's true for Germany, where I'm from. But there's big coffers here, sometimes in Germany. It's also not perfect compensation, and that's called compensation in Germany. It's called the same in Norway. So why not call it the same here in the Global South, where maybe there's less funding available? So I think me coming from disaster risk or risk analysis, it's crystal clear that there's a big chunk here and that should, if it's climate attributable, you can act on it. I'm not directly suggesting you take people to the courts and maybe this global compensation fund is probably a lot, but you could evolve it more, um, more organically, right? These bits and pieces that I've shown, maybe you can see about funding those and seeing about action. And that's actually, I think it's happening a little bit, I think, certainly with the call with their prime minister from Scotland. I think also the Germans I've seen quite often talking about inshore resilience that also goes into that risk retention layer. So I think it's possible. It just needs goodwill and maybe more overcoming these divides and these toxic divides. But maybe COVID has contributed to that because we've seen it. We're all in it and we need to act on, this ex on existential crises and climate change being one of those. Yeah, uh, keep just it, to add on to... Keep it short, so we're running yeah, out of time. Yeah, just to add on to what Trainer said. So, adaptation is also important, and we need to scale up efforts on adaptation. But what we are talking about here is the limits of adaptation. We've seen from our communities, from our locations, that the communities are not able to adapt. How much you, you know, try to support them? That's because, you know, when people are forced to leave their houses, by floods that now happen three times more than they used to happen in the last few years. Uh, the people are forced to, you know, leave their agricultural practice, whatever they were doing, and there is no way that can be replaced by some, something else. So that's the reason we urgently need to work to address loss and damage so that these people who didn't cause the problem at the first instance are provided support with and are empowered. Just to give you an example, if your house is inundated in a year, in an area for six months, seven months, eight months, what would you do? You are forced to leave this place. This situation is beyond adapt. So I think it's the just playing with the definition, as there is no UNFCCC definition, 
is just taking advantage of it, I think. Thank you. Dr. Song, your thoughts? Yes. Actually, this is excellent questions. I have a thinking about in the last few days also, uh, when before involving these sessions, that uh, 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 loss and damage, yes, are very important. There are a lot of loss and damage. But our approach is more a community-based uh, action, which also including recovering uh, uh, adoptions. Uh, and because we, we do think that uh, communities, they are really do the adoptions and uh, dealing with the crisis and changes every day, all the seasons. I experience with community, my experience with communities, like in the spring, they lose their, uh, they lose their uh, plant. They worried about how to convince the government to support their uh, insurance and then support their fund. And then next day you go to the community, community said they re-implanted already. So this kind of community enhancement to support community, to really support, to, to enhance their resilience, are very important. That's what uh, I think. It's not that the cost and the damage are not, uh, uh, the loss and damage are very important to really, to help them to recover very soon to uh, re avoid uh, uh, further damage. However, to build up their internal resilience and the confidence and the hopes, uh, I think is a long way too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Song. We've, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, um, but I mean, I'd just like to add, I think there's a real role for civil society here. Um, we can go out and do that research. We can do that work with those communities, as Dr. Song was just saying. We can actually go out and try and document. What we need to do is we need to be clear where the humanitarian spectrum works and where the loss and damage spectrum. We know those communities in Southern Africa that faced Cyclone Idai. The humanitarian response kicked in immediately after those cyclones passed through but it only provided humanitarian relief. And those people who suffered those impacts had to rebuild their houses. They had to rebuild two years, three years after the humanitarian assistance had ended. And that, I think, is a really important factor of the loss and damage debate. And the second point is, what we're seeing in many of those communities in the Caribbean, this is, this is present, prevalent in many countries, is the hurricanes are hitting them so frequently that they're not able to build the houses as robust as they were previously because they're, they're just reducing their economic capacity to rebuild and repair. And this is going to be era, this is, this is a, de a, a decline that's going to happen over time. And then those people are going to be forced to move or they're going to be forced to sue or other consequences. So I think it's, it's a job for civil society to really start to document that those dimensions of loss and damage so that we can be clear when we're in these debates to say, this is what loss and damage is and this is why it needs funding. And with that, I will end this session. Thank you very much to all our speakers and thank you to our audience.